Welcome to Lecture 4 of Less Than Nothing, titled Fixed Choice. In this episode, we will be approaching the second figure in the quartet of German idealists, Johann Fichte. Fichte represents a break with the Kantian metaphysical tradition, a break represented in a choice that introduces a fundamental separation that would structure not only the rest of the German idealist path, but of the post-Kantian divide in philosophy related to interpretations of subjectivity. In order to fully go into the depths of this chapter, we will approach it in two parts, so that we do not miss any crucial distinctions that will be necessary for us to understand our dive into the Hegelian thing in itself. Here you can see we are still in the drink before, before the thing in itself. If you have not watched the first lecture videos, I would recommend starting at the beginning and working your way up to fixed choice. In the introduction, we covered some fundamental concepts. In chapter one, we covered Platonic truth. In chapter two, we covered a reinterpretation of Christianity. And now we are diving into the core of German idealism. As mentioned, this episode, along with many future chapters, will be separated into two parts for pragmatic reasons and those pragmatic reasons involve the fact that there is a lot of depth, and we want to be able to cover this book in its full depth. First, before starting the lecture, I just want to make a quick note that you can find recorded transcripts to every lecture on my website, linked in the description. So if it helps you to have something written to follow along with, or for later study, please follow the link in the description to the transcript. Second, I want to quickly thank my first Patreon supporters for encouraging me and showing faith in me in creating this channel. I'm trying to produce the top-level philosophy content I can to improve the quality of discourse in the world, and I will continue to commit to that mission throughout the development of this channel. Special thanks to Mark Bukarev and Joshua Prentice for contributing this week. Now, on to the lecture. In the opening, Zizek asks us to contemplate the major or official couples of philosophical history, from Plato and Aristotle, Wagner and Nietzsche, Hegel and Marx, Husserl and Heidegger. In these couplings, we always, or at least typically, tend to think about them in a linear trajectory, with Aristotle correcting Plato, Nietzsche correcting Wagner, Marx correcting Hegel, or Heidegger correcting Husserl. In this systematic view of metaphilosophy, there is a type of teleological underpinning where we assume that knowledge is a progressive endeavor of one thinker building on the next, where errors by the first thinker are updated and improved by the following later thinker. Thus, we may say that Plato's crazy realm of ideas was corrected later by Aristotle, who fully embedded such a realm in the actual. Or we may say that Hegel's crazy idea of an absolute state at the end of history was corrected later by Marx, who recognized the end of states in a liberated workers' revolution. However, against this standard form of progressivist interpretation, Zizek offers that we do precisely the opposite. Instead of thinking in terms of a linear progression of knowledge with one thinker following the next, we should instead turn our reflection into a type of dynamical circle where we challenge ourselves with the highest philosophical task of thinking what the outdated thinker would say to his intellectual successor. In this mode, philosophy gets flipped upside down because we are able to think of the impossible. Of course, Plato could not actually respond to Aristotle. Hegel could not actually respond to Marx, and so forth. But in a properly dialectical act of speculative philosophy, what would Plato actually say to Aristotle? What would Hegel say to Marx? Is it simply that the earlier thinker would accept the presuppositions of the later thinker? Or is it that perhaps the earlier thinker would see the holes and the gaps in the later thinker that our progressivist epistemological ideology prevents us from accurately identifying? What if the truth of Aristotle is precisely that he misunderstood Plato's deepest insights? What if the truth of Marx is that he abandoned Hegel's deepest insights? In that situation, could we say that the problems with Plato or the problems with Hegel are precisely due to misinterpretations of their intellectual successors?
This brings us to reflections on the idealist quartet within German idealism. In the traditional line, we have Kant followed by Fichte, Fichte followed by Schelling, Schelling followed by Hegel, and so forth. In this linear narrative, Kant introduces the world to a properly transcendental philosophy worthy of the Newtonian scientific world. Fichte takes a subjectivist idealist break from Kant and dives into the world of radically engaged subjectivity. Schelling articulates the transcendental genesis of nature in the primordial emergence of subjectivity, and Hegel understands the motion of historically constituted subjectivity with a properly dialectical method. But in this line, we see post-Kantian and post-Hegelian historical ruptures internal to philosophy. We see philosophical schools which only accept Kant and reject the others. We see philosophical schools which privilege Hegel over all the others. We see philosophical schools which identify the Kantian turn as a major mistake in philosophical history, and so forth. In this intellectual mess, we miss, perhaps, the properly dialectical reversals between the thinkers. What would Fick say to Schelling? Or perhaps most interestingly, what would Kant say to Hegel? Of course, by the time Hegel developed his most mature system of spirit, Kant had long since passed away. Would Kant accept the development of idealism under Fick, Schelling, and Hegel as major revolutions in philosophy? Or would Kant see this as a regression back into the pre-critical philosophies that he sought to destroy with pure reason? Quote, when the old is attacked by the new, the first appearance of the new is, as a rule, flat and naive. The true dimension of the new arises only when the old reacts to the first appearance of the new. True revolutionaries are always reflected conservatives. True progress emerges from reaction of the old to progress. To grasp philosophy at its most radical, one should imagine, for example, how Kant would have answered Hegel, how Hegel would have answered Marx. Here we find a lesson that is deeper than merely speculative philosophy. We can also apply this lesson to the problems of our current age. Consider that, in our current age, divided between what people refer to as the alt-right and the regressive left, between people that find themselves on far ends of either spectrum, that a properly dialectical approach would be able to mediate these opposing forces in more subtle ways. Would not a liberal politics benefit if it was capable of seeing from the perspective of the conservative gaze? Or alternatively, would not a conservative politics benefit if it was capable of seeing from the perspective of the liberal gaze? Here Zizek is suggesting that, in fact, the most radical forms of the new which emerge in progressive or liberal politics often cannot stand in the actual real. In that sense, the mediation of this new by the old is simply a fundamental part of the historical process. There is no ability for one field to overdetermine and eliminate the other from the meta-historical level. The one field is structured as a polarity, even if individual human actors cannot see the overall meaning of the pattern. With this in mind, let us dive into the work of Fick. Johann Fichte is often dismissed as a false subjectivist turn or regression into pre-critical absolutist philosophy. But is this really the case? What is the core of Fichte's philosophy, and how is it relevant to us today? In Fichte's work, we see the emergence of a philosopher who was first and foremost concerned with something that few philosophers had been concerned about before him, the actual lived experience and the actual life of the mind. Towards this end, Fichte was interested in developing a philosophy that was worthy of the lived mind. In this perhaps simplistic sense, Fichte can be seen as a precursor to the phenomenology and to existentialism as a school of philosophy. One of Fichte's central claims in developing this philosophy was the point that each philosophical gesture, each figure of consciousness in the history of philosophy, should not be seen as a neutral or naively objective view of the world, but a reflective appropriation of a lived attitude that is fundamentally pre-theoretical, a lived attitude that precedes abstraction in an existential mode. Thus, in this view, a philosopher like, for example, Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, William Blake, Parmenides, or Democritus, should not be read independent from the understanding of their lived experiences, 
their existential attitudes and their embedded life history in the world. The philosophical worldview is not just an objective gaze, but a dynamical screen that functions as a pragmatic aid for subjectivity in the world. Moreover, such a conjecture is maintained within the idealist school. Indeed, the idea that every philosophical worldview reflected the existential attitude of the particular observer's real lived mind is an idea that is carried by Hegel in a dialectical systematization. For Hegel, the unity of the notion in its totality is nothing but all existential attitudes in their historical becoming, the becoming of the spirit. Here we see that what Kant set free in the idealist tradition with a post-Newtonian frame became monstrously radical. In Newtonian science, there is no room for a proper understanding of the subject. In Newtonian science, we start with fundamentally dead physical matter and its motion according to the laws of physics. However, in the post-Kantian philosophical break, we are engaged in an activity that is basically its opposite. We are dealing with the activity of minds themselves and the nature of their worldviews as emergent from the lived existential attitudes in historical becoming. In this way, we can say that what Fichte became most focused on is not simply the object or simply the subject, but the division between the subject and the object. Thus, Fichte was not just interested in a noumenal outside that we could observe, nor just the structure of a priori conceptual systems that represent the phenomenal inside, but the very division that separates them, a division that allows for a movement. Here, Fichte attempts to explicitly reintroduce God, or the absolute, into philosophy, and not in some naturalist Spinozan substantialist sense. For Fichte, God or the absolute was what emerged internal to the division between subject and object as a transcendental image that was experienced by the mind itself as absolute. Here we have a container as a perfect circle that completes the subject internal to its own motion, the pure and immovable being that can be found universally to subjectivity. In that sense, we can say that Fix absolute was not a naturalist substantialist God, but a trans-subjective god, a god that emerged in the gap or division internal to subjectivity. Thus, if we consider the Fichtean perspective, the very nature of the I-form, or the self-consciousness, as a historical conscious figure, is all a part of the imagistic becoming of the absolute itself. Every I-form in its self-positing structures, the horizon of the world and the horizon of being, and this is the becoming of absolute understanding. In that sense, Fichte makes a clear distinction between pre-critical absolute God and the I qua I form. Quote, the ground is no longer identified with the I qua absolute I, but with something prior to and originally independent of the I. By contrast, the I qua I form is the basic mode for the appearance of the absolute, which does not appear itself and as such. End quote. Here we can capture the crucial Fichtean distinction if we pay close attention. In the pre-critical form, we have I qua absolute God that pre-exists the subjectively lived mind. In contrast, in Fick's world, such notions of the absolute do not precede the form that is given by the self-positing I. The self-positing I qua I form gives the form of the absolute as the immovable ground of all being. Now, let us compare Fichte with Hegel when it comes to both the absolute and historical becoming. The first thing one should keep note of is that Fichte's structure is in no way to be interpreted in a naive or simplistic Platonic representation. Fichte was fully aware of the historicity of the absolute and its dynamism. However, Fichte was also not ready to conceive of a substanceless absolute. Fichte was not ready to conceive of an absolute that had no positive ground an absolute that was totally abyssal, or recall Plato's horror vacui, which threatened philosophy with sophistic language games, or Parmenides' radical assertion of absolute being against the unbearable, forceful negativity of absolute nothing. Thus, fix absolute as I qua I form maintains a historical absolute being, where the subjective appearing in history occurs between its two mad poles of absolute being, of a fall from the one and a return to the one, in the self-positing of the I qua I form, which grounds a positive absolute being. In contrast, for Hegel, 
We have Fick flipped upside down. For Hegel, Fick was not able to see that the appearance of the absolute being in the eye form was the absolute's own abyssal self-reflection in a negative image. In that sense, Hegel is saying that we do not need to make an extra ontological assertion of absolute being, of a positive oneness that ties together the beginning and the end, that there is merely the realm of limited subjective appearing in history, and that the appearance of the absolute as a transsubjective immovable being is nothing but the subjective appearing in history of subjectivity's own self-limitations over an abyssal freedom of negative images. Thus, Hegel's point is that there is no positive other that is consistent and complete for all eternity. There is no positive other that will always stay the same in every universe that is holding the place of eternity. There is nothing but our negativistic absolute reflections or eye forms in this absence. In this way, Hegel would critique Fichte as a step backwards in terms of philosophical metaphysics proper, a step backwards due to a desire to project self or internal incompletion, Fichte's own existential attitude, into the incompletion of subjective forms themselves, the totality of all possible existential attitudes. In that sense, Hegel would say that Fichte was all too quick to project an absolute positive container which would hold all historical subjectivity, i.e. a transsubjective absolute immovable being. From that point, the view of Fichte is a precise reversal of Kant in a crazy subjectivist stance, since Kant had to ground subjective appearances in a positive noumenal beyond, outside or external to subjectivity. And Fichte had to ground subjective appearances in a trans-phenomenal being beyond mere historical subjectivity. What we here have to confront is a strange irony of the archetypal subjective idealist, Fichte, in some sense, reducing subjectivity to the absolute being. Historical subjective appearances are nothing but the lower level reality of the absolute's fall and return for Fichte. Here we could reverse the claims that modern atheists often make about pre-critical religious belief, that subjectivity is reduced to an appearance of a pre-existing absolute god. In contrast, Fichte could be said to reduce subjectivity to the becoming appearances of an absolute god that emerges in the eye form. For Fichte, when we experience a transcendental vision, this is not appearance qua appearance, or eye form qua eye form, in a suprasensible realm but an appearance qua absolute being. In this precise sense, Hegel would say that Fichte makes the mistake of confusing the absolute image for the absolute being, and that this distinction really does matter in the context of understanding the subjective appearance of historical becoming. Here is a formulaic critique, in its totality, from Newton to Kant to Fichte. Quote, First from objective reality to the transcendental eye, then from the transcendental eye to the absolute being, end quote. This is where we situate the critique that, quote, the eye's self-positing is an image of the divine absolute, not the absolute itself, end quote. In that sense, it is totally unnecessary to labor under the presupposition of absolute being. It actually prevents us from making progress in our knowledge and our understanding. Consequently, Hegel is not the philosopher who builds up the image of absolute being, but precisely the philosopher who puts into dialectical motion the image itself. Thus, Fick's attempt to understand the life motion of subjectivity in history failed to understand that the absolute's appearing in history is not an appearance of an absolute being, but a self-actualization in an image, and that this self-reflection of the absolute is the becoming of the absolute in its imminent negativity. In this language, it is crucial to emphasize that the absolute is an imagistic shining through internal to the appearances, that there is no absolute being behind or beyond them that would ground them forever and for always. Finally, this brings us to the Hegelian axiom of the absolute. The absolute is not just a substance in the Spinozan sense, but it is also a subject with no absolute being that would ground it absolutely. Here we are able to think the pure negativity of the absolute, the way in which the absolute appears as the exact opposite of the pre-critical absolute God, as a self-effacing of absolute being. In this way, we are able to think of subjectivity as inscribed in the very core of absolute self-revelation, 
In this way, Hegel's ultimate critique of Fichte is not that Fichte is, quote, too subjective, end quote, but not able to think the way in which subjectivity is at the very core of absolute self-revelation. Quote, God is not an absolute being persisting in itself. It is the pure virtuality of a promise, the pure appearing of itself. In other words, the absolute beyond appearances coincides with an absolute appearance, an appearance beneath which there is no substantial being, end quote. Here, let us take a first look at the structure of Hegel's absolute in its most precise descriptions. First, we start with objective idealism. This is not objectivity in a naive classical scientific sense, or a Kantian noumenal sense, but an objective idealism that is a pure speculative philosophy of nature. Second, we move to subjective idealism, which, as we have covered, has no absolute ground in being but is simply the realm of imagistic ideals in themselves, what we call a transcendental philosophy. Now, in this opposition between objective idealism and subjective idealism, crucially, we do not have a third term in order to deal with the division between the two. And this is constitutive of Hegelian dialectics proper. As Zizek states, quote, There is no need for a third element, the medium or ground beyond the subject and object substance. We start with objectivity, and the subject is nothing but the self-mediation of objectivity, when, in Hegel's dialectics, we have a couple of opposites. Their unity is not a third, an underlying medium, but one of the two. In this dialectical procedure, of course, the one of the two is on the side of the subject. The subject is mediating the object. The object is not mediating the subject. The subject is processing objectivity attempting to understand its objective ideality in a philosophy of nature. And the genesis of this mediation can be found in the transcendental philosophy, where we can study empirically the ideas. In that sense, we affirm totally the asymmetry of the absolute, of the way in which there is no symmetry that would allow for a higher permanent being. And as we will see throughout the lectures on Hegel's system in later lectures, this is a very general principle that can be taken into the realm of oppositional determination as such. Thus, in the next analysis of the Hegelian absolute, we have a triadic structure that is radically open. This means that any Hegelian third term is the term for an openness that emerges for a closure of the asymmetrical relation between the two. In geometrical terms, the Hegelian triangle is never complete and never closed in on itself. In the first term, we are dealing with what Hegel calls metaphysics proper. In metaphysics proper, we are simply dealing with the fact that we perceive reality out there, nature, in all of its complexity. In this way, the task of a good philosopher is to analyze the structure of this being. This is to analyze simply the universal structure of being. As we covered in the first lecture, the task of understanding the universal structure of being was the only realm of philosophy proper before the Kantian break. Philosophy was the universal mediation on being, whereas science was the particular mediation on aspects of being. In the second term, we move into transcendental philosophy, and thus we affirm the asymmetry internal to the poles of the Hegelian absolute. In this affirmation, the philosopher's task changes from understanding the universal structure of being to understanding the subjective conditions of the possibility of objective reality. This is really the breakthrough of Kant. In this transcendental term, we are not so much interested in the appearances of being, but understanding how it could be that a reality appears to us as it does in the first place. Again, in our modern context, what must be necessary for a universe to emerge from a singularity? What must be necessary for a universe to have the spatial and temporal qualities that it does? What must be necessary for a universe with spatial and temporal qualities at all? What must be necessary for a universe to locally produce self-reproducing living systems or self-referential beings? Of course, this is a subtly but important distinction from understanding the structure of the Big Bang, 
the structure and function of life, or the structure and function of the mind. Even if we have total descriptions of universe, life, and mind, we still have not approached the properly transcendental question. Third, we move into the Hegelian speculative realm of the absolute. In this third level, we encounter a radical openness. This radical openness involves the fact that subjectivity itself is reinscribed into reality, but not simply reduced to an objective aspect of reality. In that sense, subjectivity is the introduction of something new and critical into the becoming of the absolute. Subjectivity, or the subject, is not just another object. The subject is something more like a radical whole in being. In that sense, if subjectivity is a whole in being, then what we are dealing with is a failure of absolute identity, a failure of recognition internal to being, a gap between the I, self-identity, and being itself. Now, let us return to Fichte. In Fichte's philosophy, at the highest moments, we find the desire to break from deterministic materialism. In that sense, if Kant prepared the ground for a post-Newtonian philosophy, it was Fichte who was bold enough to think the consequences of this post-Newtonian philosophy. Of course, the opposite of a deterministic materialism is the subjective autonomy of freedom, the reality of freedom, as Kant knew well. Freedom, our most basic experience, that we are agents who can make choices about our lives, that we are not just determined from all time by physical laws, is the basic presuppositions that structured fixed analysis of our existential life world and the reality of the mind. However, if we think through the consequences of both deterministic materialism in the Newtonian frame or deterministic idealism in a classical religious frame, we find that there is no space, no real space, for freedom in either frame. In the Newtonian frame, we are reduced to physical law, and in the religious frame, we are reduced to God's law. Where is the space for a free choice? Where is the space for the subject to bring about the new? Thus, here we should consider the fact that Fick's more practical view of philosophy has being embedded in an existential life world that allows for the emergence of a philosophical stance, can be wedded with Hegel's open triad of the absolute, where speculative philosophy takes the place of either a reduction to deterministic materialism or a deterministic idealism. Quote, Both materialism and idealism lead to consequences which make practical activity meaningless or impossible. In order for me to be practically active, engaged in the world, I have to accept myself as a being in the world, caught in a situation, interacting with real objects, which resist me and which I try to transform. Furthermore, in order to act as a free moral subject, I have to accept the independent existence of other subjects like me, as well as the existence of a higher spiritual order in which I participate and which is independent of natural determinism. Fichte builds his practical existential worldview on the basis of a break from Kant that there is an irreducible gap between our philosophical knowledge, as we understand it in transcendental philosophy, and our practical, ethical engagement with the world. In other words, no matter how much knowledge a philosopher has about the world and the conditions for its appearance, this in no way reduces to our knowledge of how to act in the world. What the world is made out of, and its processes and its conditions for appearances, is fundamentally different from how we should act in the world and how we should engage with complex psychosocial conditions in the world. Here, Fichte introduces a crucial distinction building on Kant. This is in relationship to Kant's fundamental claim of transcendental philosophy that a subject's knowledge is constructed from given sensations into a notional unity in free action. In this system, we have the idea that the transcendental synthetic imagination is a structure that takes a multiplicity of phenomena and reduces it into a coherent unity. What Fichte adds to this notion of transcendental philosophy is the idea of the gap between the multitude of sensations and the synthetic unity, what he calls anstos which can be translated into obstacle or hindrance. Consequently, 
In this gap, Fick discusses the nature of a primordial object, a primordial obstacle, internal to the formation of a subjective unity. According to Fick, this primordial obstacle is what sets in motion the free act of a synthetic unity, the process of subjective self-limitation. This is how Fick is capable of building a philosophy where the existential attitude of the philosopher precedes the philosophical system building itself. In this sense, whenever a philosopher or a scientist constructs a metaphysical system, we should always ask ourselves, what is the underlying anstos? What is the underlying obstacle? What set the construction of the system in motion? This is an irreducible paradox. What Fichte introduces here is objective and actually transubjective. What is objective and transubjective is the internal encounter with an obstacle, something that gets in the way, something that prevents things from running smoothly. This insubstantial obstacle, since it is not a thing or a positive being, is also what the subject comes to understand as something formless, something like an irreducible otherness that is preventing it from fully actualizing itself. Thus, what Kant suggests that the transcendental synthetic imagination constructs as a unity in a free act, what is missing from this, according to Fichte, is that this construction activity is preceded by the anstos, by the formless and irreducible otherness which precedes the emergence of a unified form. In this sense, Zizek claims that Fichte was the first philosopher to consider the uncanny contingency at the heart of subjectivity, that every necessary notional form in its unified light is preceded by its chaotic, contingent formlessness, its anti-unified darkness. Here, the existential attitude is formed in relation to this anstos, in relation to this obstacle that precedes the constructive form. This paradox requires a lot of thought. How does this structure between the inside and the outside, between obstacle and self-positing, manifest itself precisely? One thing is clear. The anstos is not simply what the I qua I form posits for itself out of nothing in order to stimulate its activity. This is the Kantian presupposition that becomes impossible after Fichte. The subjective construction, with its idealized background, does not just emerge in a de-existentialized vacuum. Thus, the question is rather, quote, does Anstos provoke, disturb the eye from the outside, or is it posited by the eye itself, end quote. The problem identified by Fichte is that the Anstos is neither produced by the activity of the eye, and neither is it an outside externality in the world. At the same time, it is in a sense purely subjective, in the sense that Anstos only exists in relation to the formation of a subjectivity. In that sense, it is an objectivity in the form of a formless real or foreign body that structures subjectivity from within, that stimulates an activity. From this perspective, we can only say that the subject-object division is constituted in its simultaneous overlapping between positing and obstacle. They co-emerge in a broken circular motion where the self-positing in its self-delimitation creates or requires an obstacle, and an obstacle in its limiting otherness creates or stimulates self-positing. In that way, what we naively think of as reality emerges from this broken, circular relation between the self-positing and the obstacle. In that sense, the I is always something that forms in relation to what becomes a non-I. The I, in its irreducible finitude, has a fundamental background or anti-background, the non-I, the inability to be full self-identity with itself. And this background as the non-I gets various names in relation to self-posited obstacles that can change throughout the existence of a life mind. This non-I, preventing full self-identity, as an infinite otherness all around me, that is definitely not me, but which surrounds me. I did not put it there. It appears as my contingent background. I do not know its limit or its nature outside of me. It is just there, appearing to me, and changing in relation to my repetitive self-limitation. However, 
Paradoxically, the non-I as purely subjective is thus ultimately the consequence of subjective positing. Or, said in another way, there is no non-I before the emergence of the I. The I qua I form produces in itself limitation, stimulated by the anstos, the non-I. Or, as Zizek claims, quote, the infinite non-I and the finite I are mutually limiting opposites in order to resolve the imminent tension of its processuality. The non-I is nothing but the non-positedness of the I, or the non-I is active only insofar as I render myself passive and thus let it act back on me, end quote. In other words, the I, in the transcendental synthetic power to delimit itself in an I form, can over-determine the structure of the non-I. What is non-I is something that forms in the I qua I form. Thus, what non-I acts on my I-form is something that asymmetrically the I-form determines. From this knowledge, Ficht proposed that the formula for the subject as I equals I, or identity, is equal to the impossible image. As we have already covered, the impossible image in itself, for Ficht, was absolute being, and this is what Hegel refused. However, the crucial distinction in Ficht's understanding of the formation of the I is that we can study the horizon of impossible images. The horizon of these impossible images are emergent I-forms that structure their unities in relation to the primordial anstos, and then, only later, receive a retroactive material label of the obstacle out there, the non-I, which is preventing the full self-actualization of my I-form. In that system, we have to reflect on the idea that Ficht himself must have thought that there was some objective non-I that was somehow in the way of his re-merger with absolute being. Otherwise, how could Ficht not already be in a state of absolute being? Paradoxically, Ficht's absolute being could be interpreted as a monstrous non-I that was acting back on Ficht's being due to the presupposition on the side of Ficht's I-form. It was Hegel's brilliance to know that there was no such positivity of the non-I, no such substantial externality that could be removed or transformed by the I-form in order to reunite with absolute being. In that sense, the way in which the subject relates to the impossible image of its own self-formation is the most crucial aspect of its becoming and the self-actualization of the absolute. Here, a quote from Zizek. The subject's identity with itself the formal, logical notion of self-identity comes second. It has to be grounded in a transcendental, logical notion of the self-identity of the I. The subject is the result of its own failure to become a subject. I try to fully actualize myself as a subject. I fail to become a subject. And this failure is the subject that I am. End quote. Here we can attempt to situate Fick's system in relation to Kantian philosophy, but also psychoanalysis. On the side of the thing, we have Kant's noumenal real, the positively existing externality that is inaccessible to our phenomenal reflection, which for Fick becomes absolute being, the positively existing transcendence that is accessible in the becoming of the I-form in history, which for Lacan becomes the non-other, the over-determination of a negative absence that structures subjectivity. Now, moving onto the side of the obstacle. Starting with Kant, we have his notional unity, the creative synthetic activity of the transcendental imagination, which is set in an eternal, contradictory, or antagonistic relation with the noumenal real, which will forever be unknown to it. On to Ficht, who much more reflectively transforms the obstacle into the anstos the irreducible otherness within that stimulates the activity of the synthetic notional activity, and which is the central focus of the self-positing entity, and onto Lacan, where it becomes the object petite a, the object cause of desire, the virtual real partial object that would phenomenally bring together the paradoxical non-unifiable opposites. Here we see the passage from Kant to Fichte is more than just a subjectivist mad path but an essential transition 
in order to get from philosophy to psychoanalysis proper. In Kant, we do not have anything close to approximating the radicality that emerges in Fichte. Quote, Anstos is formally homologous to the Lacanian object A. Like a magnetic field, it is the locus of the eye's positing activity, the point around which this activity circulates. Yet it is in itself insubstantial, since it is created, posited, generated by the very process which reacts to it and deals with it. The search itself generates its object. And therein resides the ultimate paradox of the Fichtean Anstos. It is not immediately external to the circular movement of reflection, but an object which is posited by this very self-referential movement. Its transcendence, impenetrability, irreducibility to an ordinary represented object coincides with its absolute imminence. End quote. Here, what are the consequences of this Fichtean model for, ultimately, humanity's most profound and universal obstacle, death itself? First, we can say that when we consider what happens between Kant and Fichte, we must replace an infinite outside, the noumenal positivity, with a paradoxical infinite inside, the non-I. This non-I is an impossible image that can take a multiplicity of different forms, the form of the non-I, and its action on the subject, as we have covered, is asymmetrically something that occurs as a consequence of the positing or non-positing of the subject. Considering the finite self-positing of external infinities in Kantian philosophy, scientific objectivity, or religious ideality, in all of these external infinities, we can say that their externality, their status as non-I, is always already something that emerges primordially within the realm of the self-positing I as an impossible image or correlate of the subject's activity in history. Can we not say that death, then, is the infinite image par excellence? Can we not say that death, as the infinite obstacle that is most obviously the universal obstacle of existence, the ultimate non-I that can act back onto the historical forms of subjectivity in its absolute negativity? Why is death so terrifying for self-reflective being? We may say that this is terrifying because we can never see it directly. Death is something present in its absence. Death is an empirical absence in our positive reality, something we all know about but can never identify. Death is non-identity. Death is the real void of any identity whatsoever. That is why death fundamentally limits life from within. But at the same time, cannot be observed by living beings in the system. That is why Wittgenstein said that death is the limit of life, which cannot be located within life, end quote. In that sense, isn't death a much more authentic limiting structure than any notions of a Kantian in itself, any scientific objectivity, or any notions of a positive substantial God? Here, consider a quote from Igmar Bergman on the phenomenon of death. Quote, I was given too much anesthesia. I felt as if I had disappeared out of reality. Where did the hours go? They flashed by in a microsecond. Suddenly I realized, that is how it is. That's how one can be transformed from being to non-being. It was hard to grasp. First you are, then you are not. End quote. What Bergman attempts to communicate here is what has been echoed in philosophy since ancient times. Namely that fear of death is the power of the imagination. In other words, what ultimately is beyond the absolute images of death. The answer, from the Hegelian point of view, is simple. Nothing at all. We are simply reaching the absolute limit of the absolute in its becoming. There is no absolute being behind the image, no other side to which we return. There is nothing but the void of our own subjectivity, or to quote Zizek. In fearing it, death, we experience a non-event, a non-entity, our passage to non-being, as an event, end quote. What this means is that death as the ultimate universal Anstos obstacle is something that co-emerges with the formation of self-positing subjectivity. In that sense, the nature of death as a non-I is radically open to renegotiation with future subjectivity. How this non-I acts on us is primordially something determined by the positing subjectivity. In that sense, we should not think of death as something that can be replaced with the full achievement of self-identity, of absolute being or God, but instead as the very image that appears due to the fact 
that the subject in its historical appearance has never reached its most crucial internal limitation. In that sense, we should remain agnostic about the ultimate nature of death in its empirical reality, since the becoming of the absolute itself, a self-actualization, is incomplete and open. Now, in the start of the lecture, I emphasized that we should not simply interpret philosophy in a linear progressivist trajectory, with one thinker's historical errors being corrected by a future thinker's solutions. In this sense, let us think the ways in which Fichte can be put into a new conversation with Hegel. What did we get when we put Fichte's practical existential philosophy in engagement with Hegel's dialectical nature of the absolute in a speculative philosophy? The first point we can make is that the infinite absolute, in Fichte's interpretation, the absolute being, is first and foremost a presupposition of a finite subject. This could be a conceptual or an experiential presupposition, as in, I conceptually assert oneness of absolute being, or I experientially assert the oneness of absolute being. However, we cannot say that we have any knowledge of an infinite absolute, independent of the emergence of a finite subjective horizon within the appearances of historical becoming. In that sense, we must remain within the confines of philosophy in a speculative dialectical realm of subjective appearances. The second point is indeed a properly Fichtean point, namely, that the emergence of the infinite absolute in the gap internal to subjectivity, the division to subjectivity, produces a metaphysical screen that is of fundamental importance to the practical life world of the subject. The subject is stimulated by the emergence of this image to incessant pragmatic activity. Take, for example, the scientific objectivity, which stabilizes the realm of scientific subjectivity, or the image of God, which stabilizes the realm of religious subjectivity, or the noumenal image, which stabilizes the realm of transcendental philosophical subjectivity, or even the image of death, which is perhaps the most primordial of all these images, and thus closer to the primordial realm of the anstos in itself, or the object petit a. Here we can see a subjectivity regulated by the desires for immortality in itself. In this way, the appearances of historical subjectivity are most radically and most definitely open. In this episode, we covered a lot of ground. First, we considered a non-linear interpretation of classical philosophical lineages under the suggestion that one should consider the retroactive reflections of the earlier philosopher in reaction to the later philosopher. We then reflected on the nature of Johann Fick's pragmatic life philosophy as an attempt to get at the existential life worlds of historical subjectivity. We then compared Fick's absolute between subject-object in relation to Hegel's absolute between subject-object with the crucial distinction between absolute being in its substantial positivity and absolute image in its virtual negativity. We then reflected on Fick's pragmatic life philosophy in its transition from Kant's transcendental philosophy with the introduction of the Anstos as that which precedes and stimulates any creative synthetic imaginative unity as a formless, unintegrable entity internal to subjectivity. In this sense, we ground a difference between the subject's noumenal knowledge and its practical, ethical life world. Then we considered the structure of the Anstos in its consequences for our understanding of the non-I and its ultimate manifestation in the human experience of death. Here we considered death as something open to reinterpretation by historical subjectivity, considering that the activity of the non-I is dependent on the self-positing of subjectivity. Finally, we attempted to put Fichte and Hegel into a new dialogue by understanding what the Hegelian absolute looks like within the structure of Fick's pragmatic life-mind philosophy. In this way, we put into practice our assertion that future philosophy can productively advance under reflective, nonlinear reflections. In this work, I attempted to introduce the first half of Chapter 3, Fick's Choice. However, the good news is that this was simply the first half of Chapter 3. In the next lecture, next week, we will approach the second half of Fick's choice, where we will once again dive into Fick's philosophy and how it opens us up into new levels of interpreting Hegelian philosophy. Thank you so much for joining me, and with all that being said, I would like to very much thank all of my Patreons.
Without your support, I could not continue making these videos. And special thanks to my newest Patreons, Mark Bukarev and Joshua Prentence. You have no idea how excited and happy I was when I got the messages. Thanks again, everyone, for watching and for everyone who's still listening and paying attention throughout this lecture.